Hey, good afternoon. Oh, uh, thank you, that's generous. Uh, I know it's 4 o'clock, it's 4.10 on a lovely day, and there's no place else on the world we'd rather be than here in the classroom. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Your integrity is overflowing. <laughs> uh, let's pray together, please. The Lord be with you. So we give you thanks, O oh God, for the ways that you call us, for the ways that you call us to be with persons, persons around the world, persons who are near, persons who we do not yet even know in these days. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the ways that you accompany us, even as we seek to be faithful to you, accompanying you yet once again to the cross in Jerusalem in these days. So help us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit, even, even at work in a divinity school, moving in us and for us, through us, perhaps sometimes in spite of us, by your mercies, O oh God. Help us to be attentive to you, so that we might bring honor and glory to you, for you alone are worthy, you who are the maker of the whole universe. And we give you thanks and praise, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hey, so it's an honor to be with you. I do bring you greetings from sisters and brothers at a little school called Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. Uh, this is the city of Atlanta. I teach there on the faculty. I'm one of two full-time faculty in the area of Christian education. My specialization is youth and young adult ministries. Uh, my colleague, Kathy Dawson, the other professor there in Christian education, specializes in early childhood and children. Uh, together we cover the adult education area. I just finished a major research project uh, funded by Lilly. Thanks be to God for Prozac and those of you who are taking it. <laughs> um, uh, funded by Lilly Pharmaceuticals to grant us a study on uh, young adults, persons in 20s and 30s. Why? The, my research question was why are so few 20 and 30 somethings still with us in the church, especially those whom we've raised in Episcopal churches, Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, Lutheran churches, etc. I discovered that the highest dropout rate uh, is not Presbyterian, thanks be to God. Um, not Episcopalian. Who drops out more than we do? Ah, oh, no, oh. it's the Lutherans, the evangelicals. <laughs> oh. Think about cold northern people, eat a lot of fish, etc. So that alone is the reason to drop out of the church. Um, uh, we had a great conversation. Uh, the Lutherans, do you know this? The Lutherans have the longest confirmation journey. A uh, requirement on upwards, it used to be three years, now it's down to two years. Yeah, they're losing their ability to sustain. Um, and we thought that uh, there was a correlation between how long you make young people go through confirmation and uh, whether they would stay in the church, discover that it's the opposite. That their three-year journey, now two-year journey, they have an 87% dropout rate in six months following their confirmation. And yeah, so a lot of conversations are taking place. Um, and what and not returning uh, back into the church for a while, if at all. So, um, my conversation with you, uh, essential strategies for the practice of ministry with youth. 21st century, you know this, right? Language is crucial, important. Uh, 20th century, the modern age, language is sought to describe reality. 21st century, in this postmodern age, I know, bad term, but still. 21st century, postmodern age, language has new power. Uh, language is thought to not just describe reality, it actually creates it. So your language, the way you talk about God, the nature of the church, relationships with God, your theology, etc., the ways you use to describe, it creates. It creates a reality. It creates ways of being and knowing. So our language about the nature of the church, nature of God, etc., it's hugely important for us. And the narrative, which is why the narrative has gained such power in the 21st century. Uh, your ability to tell story, your story, the, the grand story, if there really is one, um, all of that is being questioned, but your ability to tell story is hugely powerful in these days. So I'm grateful to be with you. Um, I hope it's a conversation in these next uh, hour and 15 minutes or so at the most. Um, uh, so we start with, when you walk in the door, hopefully Lee and Tim gave you um, a half sheet of paper, right? And a bag of M&M's, some of which you've already consumed. Uh, thank you, Lee. So for a small price, some more M&M's will come out to you. Thank you very much. So your job is to have that half sheet of paper in front of you. Do you see it, right? Okay. Your job is to open up a bag of M&M's. You take out an M&M from your bag. Look at the color code on your half sheet of paper. And with a person or two around you, could be clusters of three or so, could be somebody in front of you, someone behind you. 
you share something about yourself with persons around you based upon the M&M you pulled out of your bag. If you don't want to eat M&Ms, then give it away or put it back in your bag. But have a quick conversation um, and do this at least two or three times, please, if you would.
Okay, let me call you back. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt. Let me call you back. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me call you back. Thank you for your conversations. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for the candy was the comment. You're welcome. Um, so, you can either eat the rest of it or give it away as you need to. All right? What do you call this? What oh, we just did? Uh, icebreakers. Nicely done. Anything else? Spiritual. Ooh, golly. Spiritual narrative. Lovely language. What else? Fellowship, nicely done. Anything else? Conversation. Conversation? Witness. Witness in what way? Talking about witness in one's own life. Ah, uh, tell me your name. One's own truth. Tell me your name. Hell. Hell? Hell says witness, um, sharing our own lives instead of telling the truth as we know as we understand it. Lovely, that's lovely. Anything else that you want to say? Forced. Forced, <laughs> exactly. It is, exactly. We'll talk about that in a moment. Well done. Tell me your name. Eric. Eric, I'm watching you. Okay. <laughs> Um, anything else you want to say? Okay, so I teach a course on um, uh, group building theory and faith formation, and the argument is that this is sort of group building, okay? Um, and the course I teach on um, uh, group building theory, faith formation, talks about the importance of groupness, um, and there's good and bad group building out there, and so it, as a practitioner of youth ministry, someone who's teaching about the practice of youth ministry, I want to talk about um, in good group building, every person's included, in group, good group building, the leader models and participates. In good group building, each person's right to pass is preserved. So I'm on Eric's comment. Eric said this was forced. Did you have a right to pass? No. You didn't. You didn't. <laughs> so you can say by my own criteria, I'm contradicting myself. What's my thinking? I hope you, I teach teaching. In Christian education, I'm making students help, help them to be better teachers, okay? I, it's very simple. Someone asks me, what do you do? I say, I teach teaching. I teach Christian education, but my job is to help my students be better teachers when they leave my classroom. My job is for me to be a better teacher when I leave my classroom, because my students help me be better a teacher. Okay? I'm convinced in the 21st century, at every single turn, people are teaching all the time in the church. Why? No one knows anything. Uh, exactly. No one knows anything. <laughs> exactly. Well done. Well done. I've got alums who are coming back to me. This is my 11th year on faculty. I've got alums coming back to me and saying, Roger, I'm having to teach every single time. Because we can't make the assumption there's a shift going on between what we call tribal education and immigrant education. For years, we thought we were just speaking to the tribe. And now we discover we are really speaking to immigrants. Really, truly. If the statistics hold, the single fastest growing group in America the single fastest growing religious group in America? Nuns. These are not women who have taken a religious conviction order, etc. The single fastest growing group, okay, are, are young adults who self-identify as no religious identification. This is called the American Religious Identification Survey. It's done every two years. And the last one was done in 2010. One is being done right now. Uh, the largest religious group in America, Roman Catholics. You take out Asians, Africans, and Latin Americans in the Roman Catholic Church in the U.S., and the Roman Catholic Church is dying. shrinking. Exactly, it's dying. The second largest group used to be for years and years and years. I live in Georgia. Baptist. Oh, thank you, Baptists. Well done, exactly. People who really know they're saved. Okay? And... <laughs> The Southern Baptist Convention is in apoplexy right now because they have been overtaken last year in 2000, sorry, two years ago in 2010 because the second largest religious group in America right now, nuns. No religious identification at 17%. They're the largest single group. So the statistics that we see in our, in our congregations, for instance, the estimate is about 15 to 17% of your congregation has no religious history whatsoever. And I tell my students, you get up and you have the stupidity to say, this is such a familiar text. This story is so familiar. Or this song, is, this hymn is so familiar. Let's all sing this familiar hymn. What have you just said to 17% of your congregation? Oh, did, excuse me, did you think that this is for you? No, no, that's so naive. No, this is for the tribe. This is for folk for whom this is familiar. But if it's not familiar for you, you don't belong here. 
You need to go to one of those mega churches that does a seeker-friendly service that demands nothing of you that we look down upon because we're educated at Yale Divinity School. <laughs> you all need to go someplace else because we are theologically educated here and you don't belong here. You are part of the immigrant population, okay? 17%, no religious background whatsoever, and they're coming to us because they're looking for an experience of God, the transcendent, the holy, they're asking for Jesus. They really truly are in remarkable numbers. Please. Pardon me? Um, interestingly enough, for Mike, when I say um, uh, young adults, I'm saying 20, 30 somethings broadly, uh, which is a young adult category, if you will. And the record number in that uh, 17, 18, 19 percent right now is 20, 30 somethings. But interestingly enough, there are older adults in that sampling as well who say no religious identification. They prefer none. They consider themselves spiritual, just not religious, which is the problem with the question. What is your religious identification? They'll say, I have none, but I'm a spiritual person. I just don't think it's important that I have to go to church because I'm a spiritual person. And church, you know, is full of all those hypocrites and people who are just troubled, etc. Okay? In good group building, every person is included. The leader models and participates. I don't know if you saw, um, but what was I doing as your leader and, and, and uh, person who's trying to... Did you see what I was doing? I was <laughs> talking to Brent. I was. Well done. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it when uh, pastors, priests, etc., leaders put us in group building stuff. And what does the priest, what does the pastor, what does the youth director, what does the church educator do? Check good coffee. Yeah, it gets good copy. Because, you know, I, I don't have to do this. I mean, I have a PhD. I teach this stuff. Okay? I, I get to sit out while you do this. What does that say? Uh, nicely done. It calls into question whether this activity is even worth it. And for young people and young adults in this day, this is the word, authenticity. Authenticity. How authentic are you in the midst of this? In my research with young adults, I asked a really a name question that ended up being insulting. I didn't think it was at the time. I asked, you know, all these megachurches that are attracting young adults, and some of them are, I said, um, a lot of them say, don't ever don't wear albs, don't wear robes, etc. Just dress down, be comfortable, and that makes you more real, right? Okay, so I asked that question of young adults. 20, 30 somethings, most of them are not in churches. So is it more real if the person's in a robe or an alb, etc., any kind of religious garb, or if they're, if they're just dressed in a, a sports shirt or whatever, like a t-shirt, flip-flops, etc., jeans, and are they more real? The answer came back really clearly. You know, if that person, if she's fake wearing a robe, she'll be fake just wearing jeans, t-shirt, flip-flops. They said, they said, we're not that stupid. <laughs> and I'm like, Ugh. Um, If she's real, wearing jeans, t-shirt, flip-flops, she'll be real wearing a robe. The question is authenticity in this day and age. Uh, so, leaders model and participate. If I'm authentic as a leader, then I'm going to participate. Um, I just finished a... Um, a high school youth retreat for Northeast Georgia cluster. I'm a Presbyterian. That's called a Presbytery Diocese. I'm trying to translate. And um, uh, uh, Northeast Georgia. So I spent 200, uh, 200 young people this weekend. Um, every time we're doing any kind of activity, where are most of my adults? Yeah, they're in the back of the room doing what? Oh, it just, just <laughs> It makes me crazy, because I think to myself, here's an opportunity for you to actually be in community with, with young people. And you're missing the opportunity. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. So um, in good group building, I want to argue every person is included. You know, there are some activities in books that people are buying. Good Episcopalians, good Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, even United Church of Christ members, etc. Okay, And those activities say, oh, do elimination games, the person gets out, etc. Competitive games, that's the most fun. I don't think that works. I don't think it's part of the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the reigndom of God. I think each person's included. I think leaders model and participate. I think each person's right to pass is preserved. I didn't give you the right to pass. Eric's right. I forced you into it. But what did you have the right to do with the M&M's? You could just eat them, thank you very much. You could not eat them, that's true. Choose color. And so I was just scanning, and some of you put all of them into your hand. 
because you have control issues. And you, and, you, and you looked at the sheet and thought, okay, well, I know. Oh, I'll do this one. And tell me your name again. Bryn. Bryn. Oh, I love this. And your name? Matt. So I was with Matt and Bryn. And Bryn, and well, Matt did too, both just, oh, look, and then shared. And I thought, dang. <laughs> You have a, a chance to control your responses, but you're just being spontaneous. Like, what a remarkable concept. <laughs> Others of you had them actually in the color coded. You put them out instead of decided. Okay? So you do, have a, you do have some power in this. Is that an illusion of power? You can decide. Okay? Um, last one. Uh, in good group building, I argue uh, the honors the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is my catch all, just to remind me that the Holy Spirit's present in the space. Um, the one that, that touches me the most, that I really sort of grieve, and this is my problem, um, is uh, I think it means that I can't do any group building activity that wastes food, resources. Because I think that dishonors the Holy Spirit, who is the creator of all, and calls us to be stewards of the creation. My problem is some of the most fun youth ministry activities deal with food. And wasting things like having shaving cream fights, etc. Um, I was at a Pittsburgh Presbytery youth event, and they had 27 pans of pudding and Jello out on the field. We had an extraordinary day. It was hilarious. It was a complete waste of food. And the signal to our young people from all of Pittsburgh is: food doesn't matter. Food doesn't matter. Even more importantly, sadly. Look how rich we are. Yeah. There's an infinite amount of it. Uh, please? There's an infinite amount of it. There is. You will never be hungry. That's right. And we're Americans. And God must love us more because we have all this stuff. Isn't this cool? We can waste food. Okay? Um, in, um, so I would say there's criteria for good group building. And then the inverse is there is bad group building. And in this course that I teach on group building and faith formation, in group building theory, groupness is achieved through a minimum of 17 contact hours. Theorists have actually quantified it. They're saying it takes 17 hours for a group to be a group, okay? Groupness is defined in three ways. Um, if groupness is to occur, persons claim common rituals and norms. Persons share a common story and purpose. The group exhibits the ability to maintain its identity in the midst of dialectical challenges. That's what the criteria is for groupness. Let's go over that. Persons claim common rituals and norms. A ritual you know is any activity that opens us to deeper meaning. An activity by itself is not a ritual. But if the activity opens us to deeper meaning, as theologians you would say transcendence, then this becomes a ritual. Rituals and norms. Persons share a common story and purpose. People tell stories on one another. People have stories that live on and gain more power in the 21st century because of the power of narrative. And you only get that, theorists are saying, they're quantified it after 17 hours. And the group exhibits the ability to maintain its identity in the midst of dialectical challenges. Come on, parse that. Um, you who are my, my philosophers, what's the dialectic? What's the great dialectic? Come on. Remember, Hegel, German, dead guy. Ah, there it is, let's go. Come on, thesis. Synthesis. 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 Synthesis, all right? Um, a friend of mine who teaches, retired, honorably retired on the faculty of Columbia Seminary, Walter Brueggemann, um, yeah. <laughs> wrote most of the Old Testament because he was there. <laughs> uh, Walter's office is above mine. I try to stand higher in my office to get more knowledge, wisdom, etc. cetera. Um, Walter um, pulls on Paul Ricoeur, who's an educator, a philosopher, and he says the whole story of God's people is a dialectic. And he says a dialectic is orientation, what? Disorientation, nice, leading to reorientation. He says if you look through the entire scripture, it's summed up in three words. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. He's even so bold as an Old Testament scholar to say the New Testament is about orientation, disorientation, reorientation. He's saying the whole gospel story, orientation, disorientation, reorientation. That's a dialectic, okay? When a group has groupness, 
and they hit disorientation, that they stick together and lead to reorientation on the other end of the conflict in disorientation, the group is, ah, nice, the group is stronger. One of my best friends on faculty is Pamela uh, Cooper White, um, Episcopal priest, brilliant woman. And she says um, in her pastoral care marriage and family therapy class, when she's working with students who are working with a couple who are in major disorientation in their relationship, she says the, ten the human tendency when we get disorientation in our relationship is to do what? Leave. Leave. This is too hard. I want a divorce. This is too hard. But she's saying to our students at Columbia Seminary, those who are going in, especially into pastoral care, if you can work with this couple, and you can work and help these individuals work through this disorientation to reorientation, their marriage, what? It's stronger. It's, stronger. it's more resilient. They look back on that and they're like, oh my gosh, we survived. I never would have thought we could survive that. Memory is still there. Pain, sadness. They've got to work through issues of trust, mistrust. But when they get to the other side, that relationship is more resilient. It is stronger. Sadly, in this day and age, I think our tendency, when it gets too hard, disorienting, get out. I don't want to, this is too, I don't want to do this anymore. Seminary is hard. Disorientation, I don't want to do this. This isn't for me. The call is obviously not something else. When you stick with it, when you stay, and you get through it, on the other side of it, it's remarkable. You're like, wow, I guess God really is faithful, even in the midst of that. Okay? 17 hours. So they've quantified it, a group of building theorists. And by the way, corporations have picked up on this. You get that, right? Corporations that have teams of people trying to do work together, corporations are doing group building theory. Only they're going to these conference centers that cost them $27,000 to give them 17 hours because they want these groups of people to be more productive. They're looking for groupness as well. In youth ministry, I talk about group building and faith formation. You've got to work to get 17 hours for groupness. Because for young people, the crucial issue is they form allegiances away from their parents in adolescence to whom? To their peers. And to get there, they've got to have groupness. When you have groupness, then they're like, yeah, I'll give up soccer. I'll give up a band performance. I'll give up my other friends at school. I'll give up all kinds of things because this group actually means something to me. We have rituals and norms. We have common purpose and history. And we've hung through each other, through thick and through thin, through tough times and good times. I'm going to stay with these people. Please. Oh man. Oh man, golly, that's a brilliant question. Tell me your name. Jordan. Jordan. Oh golly, Jordan, you're on it. Lovely question. Um, so there's a lot of research being done on um, larger groupness. Initially, all the research is just on small groups. Okay. okay? Um, but there is this there's emerging conversation about is there a point at which knowing happens? So you get this, right? In systems theory, okay? Um, if this group that is leading the parish, called the vestry, if they treat each other with kindness and respect, that behavior is viral. It's contagious. Okay? And guess what happens to the entire parish? Everyone treats each other with kindness and respect. The inverse is true. If the vestry is full of toxicity, meanness, suspicion, mistrust, that also pervades the entire parish. And folk can walk into a, a congregation, sense it, and they're like, oh, this place is not healthy. These people are, something's wrong here. And they'll go out, okay? Um, so there's a lot of research say, um, that says systems theory talks about how this group infects the rest of the world. It's a biblical image. It's Jesus and a bunch of women and men called the disciples, who infected the rest of the world, changed the rest of the world. We know that to be true. It's a biblical image. 
I'm thinking the original groupness, disciples in a boat, storm happens. This is how you know the Lord is not me. He's just, he's just fed, fed a bunch of people, okay? Miracles galore. Sends them out on the boat because he wants to go off and pray. Storm hits, Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee. He walks across the water. First reaction, bright, bright disciples. It must be a? Yes. This is how you know the Lord is not me. Oh, and I kept on walking. <laughs> I would have said, really? Really, boys? Really? That's the best you can do, really? You just want to feed a bunch of people, 5,000 people and others. And you see ghosts, really? That's the best you can do. Okay, watch. Here's the backside of your ghost. Here, look. look, look. See? I'm throwing you boys back into the ocean and getting 12 more. My personnel skills obviously are faulty. That was not the divinity side of me. That was the humanity side of me. So I'm trying to figure this out. But the Lord, amazingly enough, sticks with these women and men. We, and we know there are women, obviously, there, too. Women and men together. And those women and men change the whole world. Really, truly. So, Jordan, you're on it. It's entirely possible. So, um, 17 hours groupness. 17 hours, um, interestingly enough, it's not um, uh, contiguous, but it has to be continuous. That's good news for some of you who are introverts, whom the Lord made also. Um, the, the idea that you're thinking, oh, good, I don't want to be with people for 17 hours. <laughs> that just makes me tired. Okay? I understand that. Okay? Although my nature is an extrovert whom the Lord favors. So, um, <laughs> so, so, thank you very much. So, the whole idea here is 17 hours, continuous, not necessarily contiguous. And it's not, thanks be to God, 17 hours of icebreakers. Because after the 14th hour, I'll have to hurt you. <laughs> okay, let's do Icebreaker 47. Okay, everyone get up. I'm like, no, we're not doing that anymore. Okay. Um, but here's the deal, and here's where it's hard. 17 hours of continuous means every time that group gathers, it has to be the same people. That's the continuous. That's the O. Okay? Otherwise, every time you gather, you are at our one. So we have a group staying together for Bible study, meet for an hour and a half. Great, have an hour and a half to 17. We meet next week. Tim doesn't show up. What hour are we on? One. One. Next week, Tim brings Jordan. What hour are we on? One. One. One, 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 one. Group of New Theory says people get weary of one. People get tired of that one hour, one hour, and that's when you get the young adult or the kid or the adult saying, you know, there's just no community in this group or this church or this school. I don't know people. The kid says to his or her mom, I don't want to go to youth group anymore. I don't know anybody. And the mom's like, sweetheart, you know all these people. Well, he does, but he doesn't have any groupness because every time he's gone, somebody's new or someone's left. And it's hour one, hour one, hour one, hour one. The research is very clear. People will not tolerate a whole series of one hours in a row. After a while, they'll walk away and say, I'm going to go someplace else where I can get some groupness. Please. Thank you, Greta. Um, your example with the vestry made me wonder how the developing of groupness in a positive sense is different if you're not working with a fresh group, but with a group that, say, might have already some amount of dysfunction. Uh, well done. Well done, well done. Um, tell me your name. Emily. Emily? Emily, thank you. Um, Emily has a phenomenal question. So if, if, for instance, the vestry already has groupness, Okay? But toxicity, some amount of dysfunction within it. And if we're honest, every group has some dysfunction in it, obviously, right? Um, interestingly enough, the group building theory says that toxicity after a while actually is eradicated. Because after you get this common rituals and norms, by the nature of common story and purpose, etc., and the dialectical behavior, that's what's key, then the group begins to correct itself. The group always is going to seek health and wholeness. The group is not going to tolerate toxicity. So after a while, when you get a new member to come in and she's trying to add in some dysfunction and, dis and toxicity, she has all kinds of issues or he does, etc., the group will be self-corrective and will eventually say to that person, we appreciate you, but obviously you can't be a part of us. 
until you get some health and wholeness. Or the person will try, um, throw out all of their little boom, I call them toxic bombs in a group. Um, they try to lob a toxic bomb in, and everyone's like, oh, toxic bomb. <laughs> Push it aside. <laughs> and the person is doing that, after a while, what? They leave. Why? Ex Eric, exactly. Eric says it, because nobody's picking up the toxic bomb. They're like, dang it. No one's reacting. Come on. This is a church. Come on. Okay? Someone should react to it and try to make me feel better. Come on. And like, people are like, oh, toxic bomb. No, nope, not going to do it. And actually, that person eventually leaves because no one's going to bite when they're throwing something in. It's really fascinating to watch and see. I've actually seen it in groups. It's fascinating to watch and see. There's another hand. Please. Wait for my please. Oh, tell me your name. Katie. Hi, Katie. Is there a critical mass uh, in oh, groups God. where if they were all meeting together and you've got like the one outliers coming in, yeah. where they would form a groupness that would be maybe exclusive to the other ones? Or is it oh, is that one person done. coming and going? Uh, nicely done. Gonna... Uh, okay, let me, see if, let me see if this gets there. Um, thank you for asking. So, so I'm, <laughs> I'm giving you a quick glimpse of one of my classes, a special on class on group building uh, faith formation. Yeah, so the question is a brilliant one. Um, because potentially, the group could become so tight in its groupness that it becomes exclusive to even someone trying to get in. Does that make sense? Um, interestingly enough, in good group building theory, you, you build in ways for groups to be open, permeable, for persons to come in. Um, and when that does happen, then eventually, when the groups get too large, they form other groups. And those groups maintain their health, etc. And we call that first century church. Because these house churches eventually begin to grow, and people begin to say, we're not going to fit in this house anymore. And they begin to form um, congregations all over Ephesus, all over Thessalonica, et cetera. Does that make sense? Your question is a brilliant one. Um, gentleman in the front, tell me your name, sir. Thanks, Matt. Oh, uh, my name is Otis. Otis? Yeah. Um, because it was sort of a, it was a question that was similar to that. Um, I don't actually completely remember it at this point. So. Oh, that's okay. If it comes yeah. back to you, let me know. Okay. Okay. Um, can I go on? Oh, please. Uh, how do, or is there a way then you can still find uh, a place for these people who, you know, continue to lob these toxic bombs in a group? I mean, can there be a, a as churches, we don't want people to, decide to leave. Um, so how do we accommodate that, or where does that fit in? Man, oh golly. It's a great, oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, uh, did you get it? You heard the question? Um, the, so two things happen, as I said to you. One is the person tries to lob these toxic bombs into the group, and the group won't entertain it, because the group is too healthy, so they resist it. So the person ends up leaving, okay? Um, come on, um, Gospel of Matthew, right? Matthew 16, right, and following? There's a, there's a pattern lined out here. When a member of the community, what? Misbehaves? What does the community do? Send someone one-on-one, -on -one, well, actually, send someone to go talk to that person outside the group with another person. I mean, the, the pattern's lined out in the Gospel of Matthew to hold them accountable for what happens in the group and how the congregation is supposed to respond. At that point, if the person still isn't going to respond and make some movements towards health, then it really is okay. Honestly, it really is okay. I teach a, a doctor of ministry class on uh, titled Failure of Nerve. Why pastors put up with toxic persons in their congregation. And it's because, and I'm basing this on a really, really fine book by Edwin Friedman, who actually published this after he died, which is a cool trick, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm yearning for that in my tenure. Um, anyway, um, I'm already tenured by promotion, etc. I want to die and then publish. Um, um, Edwin Friedman, um, a Jew, rabbi, says, um, uh, he says, uh, he's gone to synagogues, and he's asked them, why do you put up, they, and they all know who the toxic person is in the synagogue. And he says, why do you put up with this behavior? And he, has, he said, and Jews have said to him, because it wouldn't be Christian to have them leave. 
And Friedman goes, okay, what, are you listening to yourselves? <laughs> I'm like, what, Rabbi? He goes, you just said it wouldn't be Christian to have them leave. I said, yeah, it wouldn't be. He said, okay, but we're not. <laughs> we're Jews. They're like, oh, well, you know what we mean. He was like, okay, yeah, I do. All right? He said, one of the reasons why we put up with this behavior is that we believe Jesus ultimately was nice. Jesus was nice. Jesus never lost his temper. Jesus, oh, go Otis. Jesus, Otis went, well. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus never turned over tables, never called anyone a brood of vipers. That's not Jesus. Jesus, Jesus has lambs wherever he goes. And hearts pop out of his head. Okay. Um, um, oh man, this is on tape. Um, one, of my, one, of my, one of my students gave me this and I love this. Um, it's this, you know, we have the laughing Jesus, we have the, the shepherd Jesus, etc. In our, in our congregations and our, on our walls. There's this picture of Jesus that my student, it's a magnet, and it's on my file cabinet in my office. And Jesus looks mad, like, and it says, be careful, you are pissing Jesus off. <laughs> right? And I thought to myself, oh my gosh. <laughs> Why, why, are we, why are we so deluded to thinking that we're not going to hold each other accountable for a behavior that gives honor and glory to God? Um, the issue is, you don't do this by yourselves. Amen? Amen? You're trying to work a system, a groupness, so the group itself handles toxic behaviors with great power. And they realize, no, we're not going to put up with that. We're not going to pick up that toxic bomb. We're going to push it back towards you and say, you know, if you want to go someplace else, there's a Methodist street, church on the street. Have at them. Because those Wesleyans, they love this stuff. Really. Okay? Go after it. Please. Otis. Yeah, I, I think the question I'm having is what happens... This, so far, the conversation has assumed that the group was healthy enough to notice the bomb mm, thank you. and resist, right? Thank you. But that's usually groups of people who have high emotional intelligence and oh, maybe nice. have already gone through a trial. Nice but this you. last bit here, yes. the group um, basically goes through the dialectical challenge. Yes. So before that happens, yes. like when they actually go through the trial, because some groups are destroyed. Yes. And we know that, right? Yes. So the question I'm having is... Toxicity exists. It does. Right? Because people are crazy. Yes. Right? They and are. They are. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then you get hit by the storm. Yes. And sometimes the boat breaks apart. So how do you, what's the, how do you teach the group to get to the point where they will act like how you're talking about now? Where they're like, oh yeah, we know what that is. That almost blew up our boat last time. Exactly. Like, no. Ex right. Oh, just thank you. As opposed to surprise. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, what, you, what you've named beautifully, that's your leadership. That's your leadership. You get this, right? Mm -hmm. That your, so abil your ability is so aware to see where you are and your emotional systems, okay? That you know when you get pulled in and when you don't. Um, so when I, before seminary, before um, serving as denominational staff, thank you, Skip, before doctoral work, et cetera, now joining the faculty of a seminary, um, I taught um, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders English and history um, in inner city Seattle. Okay, I love middle schoolers. They just make me laugh. Um, uh, I was teaching, and I, I have expectations, okay, and, and they're high, and I love teaching middle school. I had seventh grade, this is, this is the reason why um, the Lord would never allow me to name any of my sons um, Scott. If I ever had a son, I couldn't name him Scott, because every Scott I had in my classes was a problem child. <laughs> if there's a Scott here, I'm really sorry. Um, uh, on uh, the second day of school, I'm in seventh, teaching seventh grade, and I've got a student named Scott Jones, who's right down here, and in front of him is a beautiful girl um, named Amanda, okay? And all I saw, I turned over, and all I saw, and Scott's a big boy, seventh grade. All I saw was Scott hauling off and going, bam, to the back of Amanda, okay? This is the second day of school, inner city Seattle. I expect better behavior. And so I'm like, in an instant, Scott Jones, out of my classroom, right now! And so he gets up and goes in the stands in the hall. Okay? And was like, ooh, et cetera. And so I stand. And when, I, when I'm with a young person in the hall, um, I'm going to make it as uncomfortable. In case they want attention, I'm making it as uncomfortable as possible to modify the behavior. Okay? And so I have a two-inch rule, which means that my nose is two inches from their nose. And we're talking about what's going on. So I'm Scott Jones. 
Why are you in this hall? <laughs> and, um, and he's like, I don't know, et cetera. But the whole idea of behavior issues is you want the child to articulate. Because you can't, don't tell them. You want to tell them to articulate why they're in the hall. What choices were you making that put you in this hall? I don't know. We're going to stand here and I'm going to look at you like this until you tell me, et cetera, okay? Um, at that point, I begin to realize, huh, um, this is called third-person perspective taking. It's crucial. <laughs> it's crucial in ministry. First-person perspective taking is not hard. That's called egocentrism. All of you have it. <laughs> the world revolves around me. me. This is not hard. Okay. Second-person perspective taking is what your mama or your papa or your stepmom or your stepdad tried to teach you when you were seven. Well, honey, put yourself in their shoes. Their shoes. Of course, you're seven, and you're a concrete thinker, and you're thinking, well, their shoes are probably big and smelly. <laughs> but they're trying. They're trying to get you into a second-person perspective taking. That's crucial to survive in the world. You have to have at least the imagination to try to figure out what the rest of the world is looking like when they look at you, for instance. You can't function only in first-person perspective taking. Second-person perspective taking is important. It's crucial for a relationship. What's dynamic? and this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, I'm convinced, is third-person perspective taking. Third-person perspective taking is actually rare, sadly. It's the ability to be in first-person and second-person and almost do a, a out-of-body um, look, a 360, around you and the relationship. Um, it's almost an ability to do a matrix like to, 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 to sort of figure out like what's going on here, etc. Priests, pastors, church educators who get caught up in sexual misconduct, most can never do third person perspective taking. They're in a relationship, they're counseling this person, they have start to have feelings, emotional feelings, physical feelings, sexual feelings. <laughs> they end up in bed together, having intercourse, and they're like, I don't know what happened. And you're like, we know what happened. <laughs> you were having sex. <laughs> um, when they say, I don't know what happened, that means they weren't able to do third person perspective taking. Because when you're in that relationship and you're feeling these feelings and you're married and he's married or she's married, you ought to be saying, oh, whoa, 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 Nishioka. This, oh, this is not good. This is not good. This is, you ought not to be feeling this way about her, about him, whoever. You need to get out of this. You need to end this right now. That's called third person perspective taking. When I was with Scott Jones in the hall, I realized that I was mad. I was madder than I should be. I was so mad I could have hauled off and hit this kid because he was being stupid. I did this 360 thing, and I'm convinced this is Holy Spirit stuff. God said, Nishioka, you're taking yourself way too seriously. What is your problem? The boy's in seventh grade. He's 12. This is what he's supposed to be doing. You need to back off. And bam, I like, I need to back off. And I remember stepping back and saying, just, just sit there. And he was like, what? I said, just, <laughs> just sit there. And I went into the classroom. Okay? Um, that's what saves me. I realize, gift of the Holy Spirit. When you end up in this relationship or you see someone who's toxic or whatever and you realize, whoa, 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 can't do this, this is not good. Your ability to know your emotional intelligence, nice language, Otis, and, how, and what hooks you and what doesn't hook you, that's what's going to be crucial for you and for me. It's crucial right now. You know this, you who are parents, caregivers, babysitters, you who are in relationships. I mean, you know this. When people hook you and push your buttons and you're like, Tank. I need to not keep on getting hooked in this relationship in this way. That's the challenge for you and for me. Your health. I think, and I love the, thank you for the conversation about spiritual direction. Um, for me, spiritual direction has been essential. Even as a professor at a seminary, to realize, and I get paid to be a Christian. So the whole idea is, <laughs> that, that, that for me, my sense of where God is speaking to me and calling me, that's what's going to help me in this day and age. Um, my time's um, moving fast, and the conversation is rich. Um, um, if I could frame it theologically, um, we do group building not just because we want groupness, okay? It's essential. 
Um, the theological answer is essential to faith formation. It is the very nature, sorry, it, the very nature, sorry, it is the very nature of God. And we are the imago Dei. We're created in God's own image, and God is relationship to the Trinity, so we are created for relationship. God, God's self, is relationship. God who is the mother and father of us all, God who is the son, Jesus Christ, and God who is the Holy Spirit. God's self is relationship. Someone says to you, why do we have to do all these things? And you say it's theological. It's because we are created in God's image. Because this is what we do as God's people. Because God's self is in relationship. It's the challenge for you and for me. It isn't just because it's fun. It isn't just because it's cool or we get groupness. It's because this is what it means for us to be the body of Christ together. Because we are, in that remarkable way, the great mystery joined into the Godhead as the body of Christ. So, if I can keep on going. Um, uh, my classic that I use over and over again, Kenda Creasy Dean, Ron Foster, these are two United Methodists. Kenda teaches at a little school, begins with a P in New Jersey. Um, uh, uh, it's the P word here. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, um, Kenda... Kenda and Ron say that there are three major shifts going on in youth ministry. First shift is from programs to people. Youth ministry used to be about getting the right program. No longer it is a missionary effort. No more one-eared Mickey, Mickey Mouse. Okay? Without any um, disparaging comments to Disney, etc. Um, uh, they pulled this from a Presbyterian pastor who's a friend of mine, Stuart Cummings Bond. He talks about youth ministry. The problem with youth ministry is the one-eared Mickey Mouse. Okay? Um, he says, typically, Stuart says, typically, the church has been the church and youth ministry is this one ear on the head of Mickey. Okay? What's the problem? It's terrifying. It's terrifying. Thank you, Okay, there, there is no other ear. Thank you very much. That's true. Thank you. Very, that's well said. Thank you very much. What's the problem with youth ministry being an appendage to the church? What? Ah, nicely done. So this is this is what Stuart Cummings Bond, Bond etc. and others are arguing for. Uh, what they want, thank you, is this. Nicely done. Okay. What is <laughs> a rough crowd. You know? <laughs> um, in my research with young adults, I think we are reaping what we have sown. Yeah. Yes. I think we are generations now, by my calculations, I think we're almost at three full generations of one year Mickey Mouse youth ministry. And then they end up being adults, young adults, and we wonder, how come you're not part of the whole church? Because we have done so well at creating this ministry off to the side. I was in Dallas at one of our big churches, a Presbyterian church, and this church was so proud. They had just broke ground, and they finished this $1.2 million youth house. The youth house is across the parking lot from the church, the church building. The associate pastor for youth ministry was so proud, he said, Roger, our young people, which is about 400 young people in the program, they never have to darken the door of the church. The church. And I was like, uh, 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 uh. I thought, oh my gosh, that isn't even like a one ear, that's like the ear is like off somewhere, okay? <laughs> Just by itself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> okay. Um, interestingly enough, and, and this is very kind, uh, the dean said this, um, Greta and Skip have both said this to me, um, I, don't think, I don't think we suffer from just youth ministry doing this. Other ministries that we do this to? What? Outreach. Outreach? As if that's an appendage? <laughs> Senior adults? College students. College students. Well said. Exactly right. Single adults? Exactly right. As if there's something wrong with them and they're sort of outside, etc. I think we are skilled at doing this and we're wondering what's wrong with these people. How come they don't stay with us? Because we've taught them this. Okay? Um, second major shift in youth ministry the shift is from gung-ho to God-bearer. Enthusiasm is wonderful, but it cannot be sustained for the long term. Fatigue and burnout are consequences of two shallow roots. It's a theotokos, right? So the icon is, of course, mother of our Lord, literally, who is the God-bearer. 
Um, the whole shift in youth ministry, I'm telling my students, you are God-bearers. You are not God, but you are God-bearers. You become persons who bear God into the lives of young people. Um, this is the whole pattern. God-bearer, you encounter a God-bearer, the God-bearer conveys God's affirmation and God's invitation. A period of struggle follows, a duration varies, a decision is made, whatever the decision, you move on until you encounter another God-bearer. I think that's the pattern of ministry, of youth ministry. That you are God-bearers, and when you encounter a God-bearer, the God-bearer conveys both God's affirmation and God's invitation. A period of struggle follows, duration varies, and you have to make a decision. So I am a pastor's kid, which is evidence that you can be a pastor's kid and still of the Lord. It's possible. Um, Dad is retired. Thank you very much, Matt. Dad is retired Presbyterian pastor in Seattle. Okay? At 17 years old, I woke up and knew I knew all the answers to the world's problems. I just wish my parents did, because they're stupid. Okay? Um, as a pastor's kid, I was tired of being the first ones there and... You got it. Nicely done. So I remember I'm second of four boys. And I remember saying to my father on a Sunday morning, oh, here's the other thing about Seattle. Okay, this is the West Coast. And, and I, I like, thank you. And I like playing football as an athlete, et cetera, semi, well, sort of, um, my size, et cetera. The problem is on the West Coast in the fall, all the football games are starting already. We don't get home from church until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, West Coast time. Guess what? Games are all over, okay? So I was mad. I thought, you know, I'm tired of this. And so I remember saying to Dad, Dad, I want to stay home today. And he said, okay. And I thought, I should have tried this years ago. <laughs> and my father said, um, eventually, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm staying home. You said it was okay. And he said, oh, I thought you said you weren't going to go to our church today. I said, I'm not. He said, well, where are you going to go? And I said, I'm not going to church today. And my father said, Oh, Raj, I misunderstood. That's totally different. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Because you know I love your mom. Okay, fine. You know I love your brothers. Yeah. You know I love you. Yeah, fine, fine, fine. Well, what does I love your mom? Your brothers. And you. I love God even more. And I believe the best way we show our love for God is by going to church. And then he used the D word, which is an Asian, in the Asian context is evil. Okay? Um, he said, and I would be so... That's just evil. Okay, don't do that. Okay? It's like, beat me. Don't, don't do that. He said, I would be so disappointed if any one of my sons didn't show their love for God in the same way. And I'm like, what? Well, I thought I wasn't going to church. And he goes, well, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. You can go anywhere you want to. There's churches all over the place, and nobody's in them. So there's plenty of room. <laughs> we can drop you off a Lutheran church. This is, there's tons of Lutherans. There's a Methodist church down the way. There's a Roman Catholic church. There's a Baptist church. We can drop you anywhere you want to. I said, well, I don't know anybody. I said, well, he said, yeah, that's fine. Where do you want to go? I said, well, I, all my friends are at our church. He goes, I know. Well, all your friends are at our church, but you can go wherever you want to. I said, but I don't know. He goes, I know, but you can, you can go wherever you want to. I said, well, I'd rather go to our church because that's where my friends are. He goes, well, then you better get dressed. I said, yeah, I better get dressed. <laughs> I was confused for the rest of the day. <laughs> okay? But what I will tell you is, it took 17 years for my father to be a God-bearer. Not that he wasn't before, but in that moment, you know, I thought, I thought this was his job. My best friend, Jimmy Sun, this is Seattle, Chinese-American, he's a Boeing engineer. He goes to work Monday through Friday, goes to Boeing, builds planes. My dad is a pastor of a church, only works on Sundays. And so I thought, hey, that's a good job, okay? Jimmy Sun's father has this huge manual for building 747s. My father has a Bible, same thing, okay? It never occurred to me that this is related to love for God. So, the God-bearer conveys God's affirmation and God's invitation. A period of struggle follows. It was brief, and I ended up going to church. But I'll, I tell Dad now, even, Dad, remember when, remember when I said I wasn't going to church? And he goes, yeah, I remember that. And I said, you know, that was the first time you ever said to me that this church stuff was not just a job. It was how you loved God 
And he goes, I told you that before. I said, no, no, not in a way that I could hear. It changed my life. And I've spent my whole life, ever since then, trying to do this. Trying to love God as best as I possibly can. Okay? That's the nature of God bearers. Um, third major shift in youth ministry, um, heeding while hurting. Um, God bearers take the straightforward task of shepherding by conveying God's affirmation and God's invitation. That invitation is to be in relationship with Jesus Christ and Christ church. Good shepherds do not shoo from behind. They lead and walk alongside. If you shoo from behind, first of all, sheep are not the brightest of God's creatures. Okay? <laughs> Some of you have seen them, right? And they're also, if you walk behind, they're also really stinky. <laughs> There's a reason why the ozone above New Zealand and Australia is threatened right now. Okay? Because these sheep, they're really gassy animals. It's like... Bad. Like, ooh, you never light a candle next to a sheep because boom. So anyway, the whole idea of this sheep stuff is you actually accompany them and walk alongside. Okay? Um, there's a book that I use in class called Face Shaping, written in the last century um, uh, by Stephen Jones. Um, Jones says, um, and I'll, I'll close with this. Jones says um, faith shaping, this whole idea of God bearing, he says it happens in two ways. It happens through nearness and directness. Okay? He says the way you help shape faith, certainly the Holy Spirit shapes faith. Amen? Amen? But you give nearness and you give directness. He says nearness is people just being around faithful people doing faithful things. That's all it is. Just people being near faithful people doing <coughs> faithful things. Um, my family forever, always, before meal, what? Pray. Pray. Don't ever tell mom or dad because they would be way too proud about this. But in my lifetime now, I fly a lot. I'm traveling um, and I'm, by, I'm honored to be invited by um, Skip and Greta and the dean and others to come have conversations. So I'm on, I'm on the plane a lot out of Atlanta and Hartsfield Jackson. Okay? Whenever I get on the plane, my routine is I order peanuts and fresca. That's it. Okay? When I get peanuts and fresca, what do I do? I stop and I pray. I'm on a flight, a hopper flight to Roanoke, Virginia. I'm going to preach that weekend. Do you know Roanoke? Really? What church? Uh, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Second Press, downtown Roanoke, Second Presbyterian Church. Um, uh, and so I'm on a flight, hopper flight to a, a Second Press, Roanoke. Um, Peter's Fresca, I pray. Um, woman across the aisle from me, who's an older adult and should know her inside voice by now, but evidently just missed it. Okay? Um, she says, what are you doing? And I'm like, excuse me? Goes, what were you just doing? And I'm like, I'm having peanuts and crusty. No, before. Like, excuse me? She goes, were you praying? And I'm like, oh, uh, yes. And she goes, you pray for peanuts and fresca? And, and the whole place going, that guy pays for his from Fresco. And, so, <laughs> and I said, uh, yes. I'm thinking, where are my head I got headphones. Where are my headphones? I got headphones. Um, and I couldn't find them. And she's like, do you pray a lot? And I'm like, I'm praying right now. <laughs> and she says, I'm going to Roanoke. And I said, we all are. <laughs> And then she tells me that she is the oldest um, uh, uh, of her siblings. And her next sister down, um, Jeanette, has cancer again and is dying. Married to Tom, whom she doesn't like very much. Never has. Her name is Edith. Um, she says, since you pray, would you pray for Janet and for Tom? And I said, I I'd be happy to. I'm thinking right now. I'm like... <laughs> We're almost going to land, so pray. And I said, okay, ma'am, when I pray with someone, I usually hold their hand. You want to hold my hand? And she goes, that's fine. She puts her hand out. I grab her hand. Across the aisle, I pray for Janet and for Tom and for Edith. But she gets an inside voice. <laughs> we land. We get off the plane. I get off as soon as I possibly can. Okay? Um, and she catches up to me. It's amazing. And, 
would go to a TSA and I can see the pastor, George Anderson is a friend of mine, he's, he's going to greet me and take me to church because I'm speaking that night and then all day Saturday and I'm preaching on Sunday twice. And, um, and she says, do you have time now? I said, no, actually the pastor, it won't take a minute. And there's a woman there in a wheelchair with a wrap on her head and a man who looks fine to me behind her. Because <laughs> there they are, it won't take a minute. And George comes up to me and says, are these friends of yours? And I said, no, they're not. <laughs> and she goes, who are you? <laughs> and he goes, I'm George Anderson, pastor of the Second Presbyterian. Oh, good, another prayer. Come over here. <laughs> so we join hands, the five of us, and we pray for Janet and for Tom and for Edith. Okay? Friday night, all day Saturday, thanks be to God. Sunday morning, 8.30 service. I'm in the chancel. I'm getting ready to preach. Call to worship's beginning. I look up. Back of the sanctuary. Edith. Janet, Tom. Okay, all right. George wrote to me and said that Tom and Janet have joined the congregation and they are accompanying her in her dying. He said that Edith lives in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, thanks be to God. Because <laughs> I was so afraid she lived in Atlanta and was going to stalk me the rest of my life. Okay. Um, George said, thanks for introducing Tom and Janet to our congregation. We love them. Okay? This whole idea of God bearing, of nearness, being near, just being near faithful people doing faithful things. Jones says nearness is essential for ministry. Jones also says directness is essential. Jones says there must be times when we say directly to young people, so how is your faith with the Lord? How How's your trust in Jesus? How's your walk? Jones says, interestingly, and he is Southern Baptist, he says, the problem with we who are more evangelical conservative traditions, he said, all we do is directness. We're just constantly at people. How's your walk with the Lord? How's your walk with the Lord? How's your walk with the Lord? like, give it a rest. Let it just be sometimes. Then he turns around in the last chapter of his book and says, and the problem with you mainline Christians you Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Methodists, Congregationalists, Lutherans, you never do directness. You just assume that because they're near, they get Jesus. Jones says, we evangelicals, conservatives, we need to do more nearness. Just let people be near faithful people doing faithful things. You mainline people, whatever that means in these days, you need to have some courage and do some directness. Not in oppressive, manipulative, mean ways, but oh my goodness, is this a claim worthy of your life or is it not? Or is this just some nice idea that we're just toying around with? I've said to young people, I have staked my life upon this claim that there really is something about Jesus Christ who is a savior of the whole world, and worthy. Stanley Hauerwas teaches at this school in North Carolina. They worship, they worship Satan there. It's why God wouldn't let them get past round two. Anyway, um, Hauerwas, Hauerwas calls it a worthy adventure. I love his language. He says, this is a worthy adventure. He says to young people, this is an adventure worthy of your whole lives. Mm -hmm. This following Jesus. Nearness and directness. I think that's the essential task in the practice of youth ministry. Um, I've got more to do, but there's no time. And I want to just open up to some conversations um, and other uh, follow-up conversations. So think about groupness issues. Think about nearness, directness. Think about these shifts in youth ministry. We really used to think if we have the right program, they'd all show up. Now we're realizing, no, it's about relationships. It's about groupness. That's what's going to keep them coming. Because they want to be with each other and with adults in their lives who can provide both nearness and directness for them. Please. So a lot of things that you've talked about, a lot of the things that you've talked about, um, I mean, we just talked about courage, um, about being God bears about, uh, I mean, dealing with people who throw toxic bombs in your congregation. 
a lot of these things are, are really hard. Um, yeah. So I, I don't want to underestimate that. You, you talked a little bit about spiritual direction, but um, I guess I want to hear you say more about, I, I think it's pretty easy to say, here's the things we have to do. We have to have courage. Lovely. It's another thing to sort of get to that point. Lovely. And, um, and actually you. cultivate that in our own lives, in our own ministry. Thank you. And, and to say that the problem isn't actually, there's not enough programs. The problem is somehow with us. Yeah. Um, and, and to say that and to acknowledge that and then to begin to move past it oh, in the next man. direction. Oh, man. Tell me your name. Scott. 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 <laughs> His name is Jesse. What is it? Jesus doesn't like you right now. <laughs> Jesse, thank you. Yeah, you just missed us off. Thank you. Good man. Good man. Um, uh, yes, so uh, um, Jesse, you're on it. Thank you. Um, so Parker Palmer is one of my uh, patron saints in educational ministry. He, he says, good teaching is not about method. Good teaching comes from the identity and the integrity of the teacher. Um, I want to say your pastoral ministry, your pastor, your youth leading, it's not about method. And there's plenty of methods. You're, Jesse, you're on it. They're exactly right. But the issue is it comes from your identity and your integrity. Um, I've been really fortunate and grateful for the kindness of students at Columbia Seminary. Um, my students know uh, that every single morning, including this morning, uh, before Skip picked me up, um, that I, I have my class list with me and I pray through all of my class lists. I pray for every single one of my students by name. Um, I have a prayer shawl that was given to me by a group of women, Lutheran women, at a conference where I spoke um, in Pennsylvania. And I use that prayer shawl, even on warm, warm mornings um, in Atlanta, because it, it reminds me of, they call themselves the holy hookers. Um, <laughs> bad name. But anyway, um, the, it reminds me of these women um, who are, I think, uh, amazing prayers uh, and what they do for the whole church. Um, my students know that every morning I'm praying for them by name. Um, I know when I miss that because it throws me off kilter. Um, in, and I'm not trying to just say to my students, so be like me. I'm trying to set and find, nicely done, find your own pattern. And Jesse, you're on it. I think, I think our attention to our own spiritual lives is crucial. Here's the difficulty with seminary in my experience as a seminarian and now as a professor. Because we study this stuff, I think we're easily under the illusion that this is what we're doing. And I've read the Bible all, I've been doing exegesis all day, so I don't need to read the Bible for a devotional tool anymore. I get it, okay? But I find to myself, the pattern is crucial. I was talking to Skip, a great conversation on the way up here. Um, one of my best friends from seminary, uh, lieutenant colonel, retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, which is fascinating to be in a, a school with him at McCormick Seminary in Chicago. Um, Gary Payton, not the basketball player. Um, Gary said, um, Roger, do you know why we, why we train in the military? And I said, no, tell me why. And he said, we train because we know in a moment of crisis, you will not rise to the occasion. In a moment of crisis, you will default to your pattern. In a moment of crisis, you will not rise to the occasion. In a moment of crisis, you will default to your pattern. And I've taken that in my soul and thought, if my pattern is being attentive to the Holy Spirit, if my pattern is one of praying, if my pattern is one of discernment, then in a moment of crisis, and they will come, and they have, and they do, I will default to the pattern. I won't rise to the occasion. By the grace of God, the pattern will sustain me. That's why I think this whole idea of ritual, activities that lead us into deeper meaning, is absolutely crucial in these days. So I think what you said is beautiful and powerful. Just that, yeah, we've got to be attentive. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff out there. But it's the identity and integrity that you bring to whatever the task is to which you've been called. Thank you for saying that. Other comments or questions? 
You know, it's, I know it's so late in the afternoon. You've been great in being attentive. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here with you.